and welcome to the final dinner with that I'm going to be hosting this year. Um, dinner is, as you know, a one hour conversation with a leading light in the creative industry to inspire and equip the next generation of creative talent. And today I'm having dinner with a very special guest who is perhaps better equipped to talk, to talk about upcoming creative talent than anyone else. She's a designer who's always ready to embrace societal and political spheres with her work, authoring The Other Side, a double-sided book that explored both sides of the emotional landscape after Brexit, curating an exhibition that famously asked, can graphic design save your life? She's also an educator, the Dean of Academic Programs at University of Arts London, no less. And as of next week, she's about to, well, as of tomorrow, actually, she's about to become the next president and the first academic ever to lead DNAD and that's in its 60th year. So she knows a thing or two about young creativity and how important it is to the industry. It's our very special dinner guest, Rebecca Wright. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Narish. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming to dinner. Um, so in this metaphorical dinner, Rebecca is going to share a starter. That's a project that marked, out, uh, marked her out at the beginning of her career or set her in a direction. A main course, a project that's been career defining for her and uh, a next meal, so a project by someone else that's inspiring her about what creativity can be right now. Um, and most importantly, um, everyone who's tuning in, please put your questions in the chat window because Rebecca and I, well, we talk all the time, uh, and for everyone tuning in, I'd really like this to be your conversation. So um, Rebecca, if I can just start with a couple of questions. So uh, in this metaphorical dinner, um, if we were having dinner, what would you be eating? Uh, what is your favourite uh, food or dish? I love food. So this was quite a hard choice, but I decided because it was September, I would have my favourite dish as sea bass with potatoes, lemons and anchovies. Um, because I associate it with swimming in Brockwell Lido in London on a cold September day uh, and coming home and having that I think it was the first time that we cooked it and having it for dinner and it kind of being the thing that that thawed the numbness that had soaked into our bones from the swim so that's that's dinner tonight Del delicious delicious <laughs> can you order that for two please um and uh so can, can I take you back to sort of the beginning of your career um when you were figuring out your path in um your professional life what drew you towards being a designer well, actually, I feel a bit of a fraud um, and an interloper because when I was at college, I studied fine art sculpture to start off with. And I really always saw myself as a fine artist. And then halfway through my undergraduate degree, decided that graphic design and, and actually illustration very specifically was more um, what I was interested in. Um, and then when I did my MA at the RCA, I was doing illustration, but I ended up kind of in the dark room making photographs, not through the camera, but through the enlargers in the dark room. And, and so when I, when I graduated from there, I really didn't know what I was. <laughs> um, and the, the thing that helped me discover what or who rather I don't think it's a what I think it's a kind of who I was and 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 what it what what type of maker I was was actually starting to teach and I got a job on a foundation course at LCC and it was in a way being back in that environment and exposed to all of that excitement of those moments where trying things and failure were embraced as a really positive part of learning that made me feel a bit more confident about saying actually I love writing I love making I'm an image maker but I saw design as a way that I could bring those things together so that's a kind of it's a very long-winded answer to the question but I guess I've always seen myself as many things and I've always thought that my feet have to be in one place for my head to be slightly somewhere else so to sit in a graphics department writing made sense <laughs> to be in an illustration department doing photography made sense um so yeah a bit a bit kind of wonky and did you go from um studying sculpture straight into teaching uh, I, I actually, no, I, my undergrad was half sculpture, then it turned into graphic design, and then uh, my MA was illustration. It was after my MA in illustration, I had, I had about four months 
before I went into teaching and I started teaching just as an hourly paid lecturer. Um, right. So I was doing maybe, a I think a day and a half a week to start off with and trying to find my feet having a studio and making work as well. Um, and I imagine, um, for example, um, a lot of the people tuning in and a lot of your students, I imagine they would be looking probably to qualify and then go into some sort of practice of some kind. Um, and what, uh, which of course is, um, you know, a, a great thing to do. And I wonder why you talked about it a little bit, but why that, why you were thinking about why, why teaching appealed and is it, I mean, you've talked a little bit about, um, you know, needing to see things from other perspectives or adding disciplines together. And is that part of the answer there? Yeah, I think it's part of the answer. I also think I couldn't see myself in, in, in kind of industry. I didn't know what that would look like. Um, so in a way, it was a bit of a failure of imagination on my behalf, I think. I felt comfortable with the idea of teaching because I'd kind of always instinctively enjoyed that that kind of, I guess, the environment being part of the institution. And I did do a, a postgraduate fellowship in, in printmaking for a year, actually, between my undergrad and postgrad, when I was in the printmaking workshop and kind of not so much teaching, but I guess um, working alongside students. So I, it, it was never a particular design to go into teaching, but it also had, it never occurred to me that I could be a designer without having some other experience first. I just didn't feel, I didn't feel I had that platform. And it's interesting thinking back now, because I look at graduates today, and I think that we can still do more to stop graduates feeling like they're, they're kind of graduating off the edge of a cliff, <laughs> because mm. I think it can still feel like that, that there's somehow a gap between what education provides and what the industry then not only provides, but kind of demands or asks or, or kind of requires. And do you think that's about um, education ensuring that there's more practicality built in towards the end of, their, of the courses or is it something else? Um, great question. I think it depends student by student, but I, right. think, I think there's an aspect of confidence that I think um, we need to kind of embolden uh, the next generation to, to, to recognize the value and the, um, the, the, the skills and the, the positivity and, and kind of the, um, all of the qualities that they bring. But I also do think that we have to show graduates, we have to give them something rather than imagine what this, this world is and I think this is what DNAD incidentally does very well. I think it provides this place through things like new blood um, and uh, um, and the opportunity through talks and um, and other events to to actually be in a room. <laughs> often virtual now like this, but be in a room with industry and with designers. And it removes the kind of the fear. I think it, it kind of, it's a great leveler actually. It, and, and what DNAD do so well, I think is um, position industry in a, um, in a kind of participatory way. So, you know, students work on an industry brief in a new blood competition, for instance, and it's it's not just for industry, you know, you're getting something, it feels like there's a, there's a meaningful transaction there and there's some generosity on behalf of the industry and there's a kind of um, a risk that students are prepared to take because it feels like there's a safety net. And I think all of that's really important. Yeah, I think the risks is really interesting because I, I, I... I think as well as sort of giving, you know, and you say on a student by student basis, which I, I know will be right, but um, as well as giving some of those students um, a more, more of a sense of what it's like to be applied. I mean, I imagine one of the jobs is also just to, um, uh, you know, fill a student's kind of store or well of idealism, isn't it? It's, it's, it's got Absolutely. to be that part as well, you know, you, you, people, I think students need to feel they can express anything or, or change you know, do anything to the world or change the world in any way they want. And you need sort of that. I imagine it, it's it's a balance of that and how to then come out and not fall off a cliff at the same time. Exactly. And I think for educators, this is the big challenge. And, you know, I'm lucky enough to be teaching at Central St. Martins. That's where I'm, I'm Dean. And Central St. Martins is a kind of global brand. And that means that we get lots of 
clients, lots of organizations wanting to work with our students. And the way that we've kind of balanced this, this um, the tension that you're talking about is that our curriculum tends not to be about applied projects. It's very experimental and it's about the students kind of developing a practice and situating their practice. And then we have the opportunity for students to engage in these often extracurricular live briefs. Mm. So there's that there's that place for them to hold both of those experiences and then join them together. And I think if if as a student you you have the experience of being able to push at the edges, you know, work out what shape designer you are in every sense, and then apply it in a way that is not assessed by your tutors, but is all about getting feedback from a client in response to the brief they've set, you mm. end up developing some really great sets of awareness of kind of confidence, but also you've done it. You know, you don't have to imagine what this is going to be like. You've got you've got an experience to take forward and build on. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, great answer. Um, I wonder, um, so shall we look at your starter? Should we have the starter? <laughs> so which project did you pull out for? So, uh, this was a project that I worked on um, with Lucienne Roberts. And I have to say, when you did the introduction, Naresh, um, it, it made me blush a little because my practice is almost entirely linked to the work I do with Lucy M. Roberts. Um, and Lucy is somebody who may be known to the audience here. She actually designed when Andy Sandoz was DNAD president, she designed the um, DNAD annual that year. Mm. Um, and she is somebody who I met through an ex-boyfriend. I mean, he was a boyfriend at the time, then became an ex-boyfriend, but uh, the relationship the friendship with Lucy kind of really, you know, it, 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 it was the meaningful thing to come out of that relationship. And when we met quite quickly, we realized that we had lots of, um, I guess we kind of, we, we clicked. It's just that thing where you meet somebody and you realize that your, your ways of working and your interests overlap. And what's interesting is that Lucy's 10 years older than me, almost to the day. So we have, quite a lot of difference in who we are as well and and we you know, I'm quite tall you can't see because I'm sitting down I'm quite tall and I'm fair she's quite short and dark <laughs> she's a typographer I'm an image maker she's industry I'm education and we always tease each other and say the biggest difference is that I'm an optimist and she's a pessimist <laughs> and that's what has made us work so well together and drip dry shirts this book project was a, a, a book that Lucy was working on at the time. I think she just got the contract, the commission, just about when we met. And then through the conversation, she realized that, that well, she saw something in me that nobody had before, which was that probably just because of the way that I was talking and we used to chat such a lot. She said, I think you could write. Have you done any writing? And I said, no. And she said, I want you to write for this book. Um, and the book itself was a project. So it's an unusual title, Drip Dry Shirts, The Evolution of the Graphic Designer. And it was Lucy's um, project in this book was to kind of contextualize graphic design and take it away from the kind of the faddishness of kind of contemporary design world and the latest trend and look back at those really kind of pivotal figures who, who helped develop graphic design into this, this kind of discipline and this career. And to do that by having quite personal kind of autobiographical conversations and interviews with those designers, and then asking them to, to, to kind of reference or to, to make an introduction to somebody they felt they'd influenced or impact, impacted who could also give their perspective on this designer. And so a bit like this conversation now, it was a very conversational approach to, to, to um, a book. And my task was to write the biographies for the uh, contributors. And that was quite daunting because the contributors got to check what I'd written and they had to sign, sign it off. And I'd never done any many? writing before. I had 10 to do, and they were a thousand words each. That's enormous. It was a lot of work. <laughs> it was a lot of work. Um, and I was only teaching part-time at that, at that 
um, point, and I was at LCC, London College of Communication, um, teaching on illustration. And I set myself a routine of getting up really early in the morning to start writing these. Um, and my internal critic, that voice which tells you, this is terrible, God, this is awful, was like at full volume for this. And it, it was just such a steep learning curve for me. So the, the biography is such a tiny bit of the finished book, but in terms of the learning curve for me and realizing that I, a, that I could write in the sense that I, I could do it. It was hard and painful, <laughs> but I could do it. But also that I actually, I really enjoyed the criticism, the kind of editorial feedback that I got both from Lucy and from the, the designers I was writing the biographies of. And I really enjoyed that sense of creating a thing so they were finished, you know, I was kind of freelancing at that point and it all felt quite speculative. And to write these biographies, which had a start and a finish and a word count. So I had a really strict word count. There was something about the shape that I really, I found very satisfying. Um, and I think the, the, the trick that I learned that I still do now is that when I'm writing something that is for an audience, so not just notes to myself, I read it out loud because I have to hear what it sounds like. And that helps me with the punctuation. It helps me with, I think I can be a little bit kind of florid and overcomplicated and it helps me edit and, and kind of pare back. Yeah. I th that's a that's a great um that's a great starter i i i wonder i i imagine everyone watching this is thinking the same thing i'm thinking which is what um what given biographies of contributor biographies of significant people are already high stakes you know and this is you sort of feeling your way into editorial writing um what what drew you to say yes to that i mean that's <laughs> I'm really bad at saying no. Right. Okay. It's weakness. I'm really bad at saying no. But also, I two things. One, it was Lucy asking. So yeah. I really felt like she was asking me to do something that she felt I could do. Um, and actually, it was just it was exciting. The idea of working to something which would then be published was really kind of thrilling. Um, my dad was a publisher and I grew up in a household with books as kind of king of everything. Um, and I, I love books and I'm an avid reader um, and the opportunity to kind of, I don't know, test myself in that way was, was a bit irresistible really. Yeah, well, well done for saying yes. I mean, and that, that, that must've been, a, as you say, a very sharp, learning it, curve I it mean. was you know one of the things just struck me as, as we're talking actually which was that my sculpture background I think comes in a little bit to how I approach writing and I've thought this about making before as well but when I was on foundation I had a tutor who and I, I'm not sure whether this is entirely kind of um it's kind of a, it's an oversimplification of something but I think there is a grain of truth in this she said that one of the things you had to think about when you approached a piece of white paper was are you somebody who likes to make the first mark and then draw out so you're the builder you build putting the marks or are you somebody who wants to put lots down and then subtract and find within what's there and I am definitely the second like I am happier covering a page and I would do it in, in, on foundation I'd cover it in black charcoal and then I'd use my rubber to make the drawing and I'd take away I'd subtract and I think I'm still that's how I write I like to put everything in <laughs> and then edit like editing is one of the most enjoyable satisfying things for me how interesting I'm completely the other way I, um, <laughs> I well I'm I'm always um just checking my word count just to see if I can get up to the work I you know Oh God, I'm a quarter of the way there. I'm half the way. Anyway, um, I, I, I manage and you, you manage very well. Um, question from Ketty. Um, Ketty's saying, hey, Rebecca, um, I have a bachelor and master degrees in fine arts. And now I'm an art director in, the agent, in an agency. In future, I'd love to be a creative director and teach students in universities too. So what subject or field would you recommend me for, to, to do for a PhD? <gasps> Oh, wow. Um, well, first of all, it's fantastic to hear about 
your journey because I'm I'm a great believer that most journeys aren't linear <laughs> and that we move through disciplines and and that that's that's enriching and it's and it certainly makes for a great um, kind of perspective as an educator I think um, PhD is is really tricky because I think the key thing with PhD and instantly I don't have a PhD many of my colleagues uh, do um, and it's definitely something that I'd like to consider at some point in the future but I think it's a it's a slog a PhD as well as being an amazing um, kind of rigorous intellectual um, kind of pursuit I think it just has to be that you really want to investigate the subject. So the key thing is not what's most useful. It has to be, what is it about what you're interested in that is going to sustain you over a number of years? And I think the people I know, most of them have taken between kind of four and seven years to complete their PhD. So you've kind of got to love your subject. Um, I think what, what, is really valuable about having a PhD if you're going to go into education is that you you really are having to re-experience learning and I think the rigor I use that word that rigor that a PhD requires is such a great thing to be able to take into teaching and to and to teach students about and to, and to have that as a kind of lived experience rather than just a notion <laughs> that that rigor is is something which has value um and you sound like you've had an amazing career i mean that's a, that's already a, a formidable set of experiences yeah and I, finally you can be a phd student and teach by the way you don't have to wait till you've got the phd student um phd um and that's another thing that i think students often really appreciate learning from and with tutors who are kind of familiar with what being a student is. Great. Um, Elena's got a question, which is, um, what university subject is best for getting a job at the end? I'm interested in being a designer. It's a very great practical question. It's I think. a fantastic question, and it's so hard to answer. Um, I think I, honestly, I think that you, a, a degree like graphic design attracts people who want a job as a graphic designer on the whole, whereas, you know, subjects like fine art tend to attract um, st more students who are, I guess, a bit more agnostic about what they might want to do with their work. So some will want to be fine artists, but others might want to move into kind of related spheres. I think it I mean, I, I would say this because I changed degrees halfway through, but I think it's OK to change your mind. <laughs> I think it's OK to start on a journey and then realise through what you learn about yourself that you might need to change tack. Um, and we have students who do that all the time. I think, again, I'd really I'd really want and I would ask any student to be doing kind of good research about where you're going to study. And I know we've been in a virtual world for the last kind of 18 months, but my, my kind of top advice to anybody thinking about going on to study at this point would be go and visit the institution if you can um, and, and, and see if you can talk to students. So a good institution, if they're not doing an open day where you've got students there, will put you in touch, give you email addresses. Um, and I think that there's, a, there's an aspect of kind of instinct that you have about where, where the right home for you is going to be. And if that sounds a little bit kind of touchy-feely, I really think that particularly um, at HE, so an undergraduate degree or a postgraduate degree, you have to take a lot of risks. You have to be prepared to feel uncomfortable because learning is uncomfortable. That's just the truth. And it's much more uncomfortable than most of your previous experiences of learning will be. And so you need to be in a place where you can kind of see and feel yourself. And a lot of that is about how you feel when you're in a building or you meet people. Um, and, you know, I knew when I was going off to study sculpture that I... I went to a few places in London, and I just could not see myself there. And it took me going to Bath, which had a very, still does have a very good fine art um, course, and, and walking in and thinking, I, I just, this feels like somewhere that I could learn and that I could live. 
And the course was wrong, but I changed tack. I found a way to kind of move across when that, that, that was wrong. Um, and employment was never particularly at the forefront of my mind. And I think it really is now. I recognize um, from this question what most of, you know, a lot of students will say. It's just how, how do I get the job? And I think the networks that you make at college also count and those networks are as much about students who graduated from that course and the tutors and your peer group in particular the people that you study with that they, they tend to be the people who help get you work to start off with um, and use dnad i would say that of course but dnad is such a good um, organization in terms of bridging that gap, as I've said before, between education and industry. I'm not sure I've quite answered that question, but it's it's not quite as simple as saying this degree equals a job. Um, if you find the right fit for you, you'll make the right work and then you'll have the portfolio which most represents you. And that's where you find the right job for you, not just a job. You know, you need a portfolio which is uh, which communicates who you are as a designer, what type of work you're interested in, and then the then it's much easier to find the match, find the fit. I think that's great advice. Thank you. Well, we've got more questions rolling in, but I wonder whether we should just um, perhaps go to your main course yeah. first, and then I can come back and pick up those questions if everyone's okay with that. So, um, oh, I forgot to ask you, by the way, in the start of why was it called drip dry shirts? <laughs> Oh God, another great question. So it, Lucy's father had been, was a designer um, and one of her memories was of these drip dry shirts hanging above the bath. Um, and for her, it symbolized the, um, the kind of the professionalism, the status of the graphic designer at that point in a way, um, but also the modernity <laughs> at that point. So the shirt was kind of symbolizing that, 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 you know, this was a period, the evolution of the graphic designer, that there was a period where these were, these designers were at the top table. They were part of a, you know, a kind of a business board with the, there was a respect of the profession. And that was kind of echoed in some of, in this clothing, you know, the more formal clothing you dressed in your, in your shirt to go to a meeting. But there was also this modernity of, you know, it's a drip dry shirt. It's using the latest, the latest material. We're modern, we're modern cool cats. Perfect, perfect. Okay, take us to your main course. Okay, so this is the exhibition um, called Can Graphic Design Save Your Life? And what I haven't said about Lucy and I, so following on from working on drip dry shirts, I worked on a couple of other of her books. And then Lucy and I worked on a book together for Lawrence King, which was called Design Diaries, um, where we looked at creative process in graphic design. And when we were making that book, one of the things that became really apparent to us interviewing design studios was that graphic designers are quite good at making books for one another and kind of in a way self-congratulatory books that are very insular and what was so interesting interviewing these design studios around their creative process was when they talked about their client and having to having to learn about this other subject in the world because you know graphic design is effectively a kind of service industry you work for a client and there's this other subject or other other person or other field you're describing and that led us to come up with the idea for graphic design and and graphic design and started out as a as a kind of publishing project um, where we wanted to make books that linked graphic design with all these other subjects so we had graphic design and and we thought we could have and literature math science philosophy I see. Um, and because Lucy's a pessimist, her view was that we needed to have the ampersand and not have anything there because then we could have enough to kind of enough subjects, we could put any subject after graphic design and, and we would have enough subjects until we die. Because she, she was kind of preoccupied on how much we could do before we died. <laughs> and as the optimist, I was like, what's so brilliant is we can connect with anything that anything. we want. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so we did a number of books and then 
we'd wanted for a while to do a project which was linking to health and I think again Lucy had thought maybe there was a death project in this graphic design and death but anyway we went to the Wellcome Collection in London um, some of you will know this it's an amazing um, institution which really explores what it is to be human through this combination of science and an art in, a, in very broad terms. Um, and we went to them to say, could we come and use your archives? We think that there's some stuff in your archives. They have these amazing graphic ephemera archives that, that we think we could use for a book. Um, and it took, it took a few months of us kind of going into the archives and starting to hone an idea um, around this book for us to, to realize with welcome that this might not be a book, it might be an exhibition. Mm. And that it, the, the, the idea of graphic design and health was to show where graphic design has value in the world. So graphic design and our ambition is always to demonstrate what graphic design, um, what value it brings and what it, what work it does in the world and to make books and projects that kind of, in a way, demystify graphic design. So we always think our audience is not just graphic designers, but it has to be accessible to, to audiences who are the consumers of graphic design. And, and actually that's everyone. So this project, Can Graphic Design Save Your Life? Um, grew and grew and it was a four-year project in the end from those first meetings to the exhibition opening and Graphic Design and co-curated this um, exhibition with uh, Welcome. We worked with um, Shamita Sharmajara at Welcome who was the curator there and we pulled together this exhibition of examples of how graphic design works in relation to health. And we had, um, I'm just counting the sections here. I have to go to my notes here. One, two, three, four, five, six sections in the exhibition. We had persuasion, education, hospitalization, uh, medication, contagion, and provocation. And it, in each of those sections, we were trying to show a range of examples that demonstrated um, or, or kind of evidenced what graphic design does in a range of contexts um, and we in all our projects what we try to do is include well-known designers because that's important but to include designers young designers students who whose work hasn't been profiled before and from around the world and of different ages so we, we really make an effort to be as inclusive as we can because we think that's important too and i mean i love i love <clears throat> i love the provocation of it, obviously, you know, it's sort of, dare I say it, quite clickbaity as a title, right? Yeah. Completely. Well, listen, not not everybody's going to think, oh, a show on graphic design, I must go and see it, especially at Welcome. And one yeah. of the moves from them was, we want to expand our audience base, and we want, you know, this has to be an exhibition that attracts. Um, the, the general public and the people who work in science and health, not just the graphic designers. So the question was just that really simple device of exactly being provocative and being rhetorical, but also inviting you in. You know, you have to go in to find out whether whether you think the answer to that is positive or you know, affirmative or not. I remember going past it on um, uh, my bus goes past the Welcome Collection on the way to on the way to Pentagram, and I remember going past it, taking a picture, and definitely a raised eyebrow at the title. <laughs> uh, what, why, why, um, and what's behind the need to show or to demonstrate the value of graphic design? Why is that a question? That's a great question, and I think Lucy and I really kind of. It's something that we returned to quite a lot in the early days, like, is this an insecurity on behalf of graphic design that we feel like we need to prove our worth? <laughs> or is there something a bit more fundamental and actually kind of idealistic and political here, which is that, that graphic design does play a role. It's often underappreciated because graphic design is everywhere. Um, and we don't have a particularly kind of well articulated um, kind of language that elevates what graphic design is. And, and, and I think that's right. But we, we had two kind of, I guess, things at the, at the heart of this. One was thinking, 
if people who use design understand better what design can do, then graphic design may be commissioned in um, to, to serve a better range of purposes, you know, that, that graphic design is not just to sell, it is about public health campaigns, it is about education and access. Um, so we, we've always had, and, and Lucy, you know, has political pedigree um, uh, going right back to when she graduated from um, the Central School as it was then, um, and, and, and has worked for the Women's Press and worked for NGOs and political parties kind of throughout her career. So we do have this idealistic kind of, you know, fervor behind it. But we also really felt that graphic design there is something around the status of graphic design that troubled us that that the voices that were most heard that the way we talk about it within our own industry was just as I said kind of too inward looking and too mm. I don't know it wasn't we didn't feel that that well we just felt there was a gap we felt that there was something that wasn't being talked about within our industry and we couldn't see any other books doing that of course there are there are things and there are journals um uh, that, that, that have picked up this, but I think it was just a gap and it was really interesting to us to, to, to explore graphic design through other subjects and to say very openly, we're not the experts in these other subjects. So this is a collaboration. Each project is a collaboration with an expert from another field. We'll be the experts in graphic design and we'll, we'll design this, this kind of product. And in this case, the exhibition. Um, you know, again, everything's a collaboration, um, but but the health project felt to us such an important one because the project grew and grew um, and it, it, it had a huge, well, pretty large visitor numbers. I think it was 130,000 visitors over the three months it was open. Wow. But what was so great was the visitor feedback um, and the fact that Welcome reported to us how many kind of charities, um, medical organizations, journals got in touch to say, can you put me in touch with a graphic designer? <laughs> you know, it kind of opened their eyes to what graphic design can do. And I think for me, that was another, that was a, another moment of like, great, we're, 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 we're advocating for graphic design. And that's, I really feel a responsibility to do that. I feel that through education, through DNAD and through graphic design and. Yeah, well said. Um, I'd love to come back and ask you about collaboration in a second, actually. Um, but um, meanwhile, you're, you're, you're arousing interest from um, the people watching in the idea of teaching. So um, right. we've, got three, we've got three questions here about teaching. Yeah. So um, one's from uh, Irem Tu. Uh, do you think you can teach something you hadn't studied academically? <laughs> Oh, that's such a good question. And I have to say yes, <laughs> because I think all of us who teach would feel that we do that at points. Um, I think you can, because I think you, you don't have to be an expert in the discipline in order to ask questions. And I would say that one of the things that's been really interesting with the kind of the incredible um, uh, explosion in technology and what that means for creativity and kind of social media. Um, you know, we have students now who will have knowledge and skills and experience that far exceed many of the teaching staff. But, but what we have as teachers is a framework in which to be critical and to ask questions. And I think that that's a really important part of what um, kind of higher education is about. It's about this kind of critical analysis. So yeah. yes, I think you can. I don't think you can teach somebody, you know, if you're not a printmaker, I don't think you can teach somebody to, to make prints, but I think you can still teach in terms of engaging that, that, that student in learning. Yeah, yeah, I, that's a really good answer. Um, a sort of related question from MG, I was asking you, hi, when I was young, uh, I did not study academic stuff. I did my graphic design and multimedia in diploma. Um, then I entered the industry without my first degree. Now I'm working in academia. Do you think it's crucial to have a degree for creative, to be a creative or design lecturer? No, I don't. Absolutely not. I think what's interesting is that there's a little bit of a split in the UK in terms of kind of education now, where in order to get some of the more established positions in education, 
there is an expectation that you will take some qualifications around teaching and mostly the 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 universities will provide that for staff so there is this idea that that qualifications do matter but those qualifications don't have to be a degree in in a subject or um, something which we might think of as a kind of conventional kind of set of learning um, but then there are also lots of opportunities as i'm sure the person who's asking the question knows to teach based on the professional experience that you have um, and I, I i think the more varied the experience of the lecturers involved in education the better um, and students certainly really value having people teaching them who haven't just done the linear route for sure right interesting um it's, it's a quick question. I'm going to perhaps suggest you answer it quickly because it's like basically just picking your brain, I think, um, from Fatini. Uh, hi, I'm a junior graphic designer and I'm interested in studying filming and scenography. Um, do you have in your mind any university courses? Thank you. <laughs> Where should Fatini Fine. go? Do you know what? It would really depend. I think what's interesting now is that you'll find that there are short courses as well as kind of more established courses like degrees or diplomas. So I think the first thing to do is to kind of really think hard about what type of commitment to study you want to make. Um, and there are some really good taster courses that you can do. So a lot of universities, including University of the Arts London, do short courses that you could sign up to and do, you know, over a number of weeks, some evening classes. Um, and the other great thing about short courses is that they can be diagnostic and they can help in terms of not just building a portfolio, but helping you identify which courses may be the appropriate ones for you so i would i would recommend that and, and and there are places like dnad you know there are there are organizations where you can you can kind of start to see how you might learn more about a, a discipline and the types of work coming out of different institutions so you know there, there, are, there are lots of um, interesting film courses and sonography courses um, that, there are definitely ones at ual i would say that because it's my institution. <laughs> Great answer. Um, let's talk a little bit about collaborations and then move on to your uh, next course, if that's okay, which actually is a collaboration, interestingly. Um, so you talk about your collaboration with Lucy. Um, you talked about um, uh, graphic design and health, for example, and the whole and concept is about collaboration, isn't it? And we um, did a collaborative showcase for Central St. Martins, which we called Plural, which Re um, Rebecca and I selected um, work that the um, students have done, the graduating students, but only only collaborations, because I think we were very interested in that. Um, and then in a way, I guess we've, this has been a collaboration, isn't it? You're um, uh, in, in terms of the last year and, you know, you as deputy and me and pre as Prez, and we've just been talking all the time, just making sure we've got a joined up agenda. Um, yeah. And I suppose the, co the collaboration question is, I suppose it's easier to be collaborative once you're in work and you've got a job, but I wonder whether you could have, if you could advise people sort of looking to get their first job or at the start of their career, because collaborations don't really get hired, it's individuals that get hired. So what's the relationship between collaboration um, and hireability or how do you balance that? And why is collaboration so important to you and the creative industry? So I'm gonna start with that last question first, I think. And rather than being important to the industry, I'd say that collaboration is important for the world <laughs> because the challenges we face aren't siloed. Like you, you can't, we can't solve or address things like social injustice, climate emergency, you know, without collaboration. So I think in that sense, the, the kind of the validity of the importance of collaboration as a skill is only going to continue to grow. The difficult thing is it's really hard to teach. And actually one of the things that we've experienced um, at, at UAL is that collaboration is messy and it often doesn't work. And it is frequently filled with feelings of um, injustice in and of itself so that collaborations aren't equal or that you know you're not getting your reward um, and and I think the expectation that many of us would bring to collaboration are just not realistic and so one of the things that 
I think is really important is that students and young creatives are exposed to collaboration frequently and get to learn their shape. I'm going to use that again. And it was something I picked up from um, a, a, a friend and somebody who was also a, a, a lecturer but in fine art, Joe Addison, um, who used to talk about the shape you draw around yourself. And I love this visual image of the fact that all of us have a shape around ourselves and we redraw that constantly. And I think education is all about you working out where your hard edges are or your soft edges are. Where do you, where do you, mm. where do you shift? Where do you kind of, you know, build your rigidity? And I think for collaboration, there's no, you, you can't have a set shape. You have to work out where you shift. So Lucy and I, in our collaboration, we, we write together collaboratively. I, I don't think I can do this with many people, but Lucy and I, we did a book together called Looking Good, which was a visual guide to a nun's habit. <laughs> and we commissioned a theologian and a graphic artist as this kind of record of these nuns habits across the world in terms of Catholic orders. It was a bizarre project, but it, it, it was a really beautiful project. And we had all this kind of, dense theologic text that we had to rewrite so that it was really accessible and we wrote that together we'd sit down at a laptop together wow. and we wrote together and I think we could only do that because we I, I I think we know each other really well we don't take any criticism personally and we really genuinely think that we can achieve together something we couldn't achieve alone. So it's worth the pain and the agony and the difficult, you know, the kind of the, the labor, because at the end of it, you get something you couldn't have achieved on your own. That's such a great answer about, um, you know, the world problems are, are going to be solved by um, people coming together, sharing different knowledges, different disciplines, etc. I, I, I really agree with that. And, and also sort of ego is the antithesis to that, I think. Yeah, yeah. I would say so there's, that, there's that difficult thing. Is I I talk quite a lot about confidence and the need for students to have confidence and for us as educators to instill it. And then you're right. We're also kind of saying, but you have to know when to be humble and you have to know when to check your ego in. And you know that the Central St Martins is this funny kind of institution because historically, so when I was a student, it had a reputation for being so arrogant. And Jeremy Till, who's our current head of college, was really great when he started in post um, around the same time as I did, around 10 years ago. And he said, the thing about Central St. Martins is we're confident, not arrogant. And we've just got to make sure that we that we communicate that because arrogance is immediately excluding and off-putting and um, uh, you know and problematic. But confidence is all about empowering. Um, and it's, you know, confidence if it should be inclusive and it should be kind of far reaching and it should be a positive force for change. Um, and I think that that, again, for students now, that's a pretty, you know, that's what education is about. You learn, you learn about your confidence and and kind of, again, where the edges are on that. And I love the idea of drawing, drawing that and drawing your shape and drawing the shape of the collaboration. I think that's really wonderful. Um, I'll see if the team fancy doing that tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, I think we don't have too much time left, so I think it's probably good to move on to the next course. And then there are a, a gazillion other questions I'd love to ask you, but um, um, I think let's move on to the um, the next course and then perhaps just um, take pick up a question or two after that. Thank you. So you asked me about the next meal and work that I was looking at that that is inspiring me and making me think about what comes next. And of course, the answer is work by graduates, you know, the next generation. Um, and it would be remiss if I wasn't saying that. Um, and I thought that I would share the work of Sisterhood, who are- um, Love Sisterhood. They're, they're, they're brilliant. And they, they are graduates from Central St. Martins and from the Graphic Communication Design Programme, uh, which I used to be Programme Director of. Um, and Rebecca and Rashita, who uh, founded Sisterhood, were, as students, just, they kind of epitomised, I think, what good studentship is about, which was that they were open, incredibly open-minded and open to 
the discussions and the challenge that education involves. And they were incredibly generous. So they were students who were involved in every event, exhibition, kind of, you know, student-led initiative. Um, and I think the great thing that happened for them, and this came both from them and also because I think the, the environment in the course and kind of key tutors, they kind of realized that that was in and of itself um, a, it, something that, that kind of could become a thing. And sisterhood work to empower young girls and women. Um, and what they do so well, I think, is that they draw out of, of, of these, these girls and women what they want to be and what is already there. They don't impose upon them a set of values or a set of expectations. Um, and that for me is a really interesting thing about education. And when I first started teaching, I remember asking somebody who uh, was a friend of my father's who, who taught, um, and I said, what would your tip be for teaching? You know, I've never taught before. And he said, don't talk too much. And he said, eat a sandwich during a tutorial, you know, do something which stops you from talking because you've got to, you've got to learn enough about what your student wants or is trying to say in order to be able to draw that out. What you can't do is tell them what to do or get them to do what you have as a, a, as a kind of an idea for them. And I think the way that Rebecca and Rashita have developed sisterhood and the way in which they go into schools and they, um, they, they do these workshops and programs, it's about drawing out a voice and it's about kind of elevating and empowering and building confidence. Um, and I think that's, that's both a very rare skill, but it's also a rare um, kind of perception that they've had to recognize the validity of that. And mm. that is so exciting because increasingly young creatives and graduates are doing more of this and they're finding a way of saying that the values I have as a person <laughs> are not different to the values I have as a designer. So how do these two come together? Um, and, and yeah, so, so, I wanted to share sisterhood because I think, I think they're doing something really special, but I also think um, they're a great example of where that idealism has not been pushed aside. It's actually at the heart of, of, a, of this project. Yeah, I really agree. I think they're wonderful. We've been lucky enough to um, help them with one of their cohorts and uh, uh, my team did and uh, all our team did, and we really enjoyed it. And I think they're very genuine around um, you know the, the societal role of design um, and, and very genuine about what their what their students or their cohorts really want to do and express and they're very good at um, letting that come through yeah it's, it's really fantastic um, so I'm just going to ask you one final question there's so much I could ask you about mm -hmm. writing politics um, covid etc uh, and that question I said I was going to ask you what is design luckily you've dodged that one right um, but um, so like what's going to happen very soon is you're going to be the president of the DNAD in its 60th year. Um, and what do you have planned? What shakeups do you have planned? And what would you put in place to make DNAD even more valuable to next generation talent? So I, I think I should start by saying it feels a complete privilege um, to be the first educator to have this, this platform. And it is a platform. Um, so I, I really do think that one of the things that, that we have to make the most of, not just through kind of foregrounding education, but because this is the 60th year. So it's a moment of kind of celebration, I think, of everything that DNAD has done. Um, but what I really want to do is make learning the kind of the, the, at the heart, put learning at the heart of, of what DNAD is over the 60th year. And I'm particularly interested in how I think over the last 18 months, notions of learning have kind of been challenged. So perhaps that expectation that, you know, students or young designers on this course call listening in now may think, you know, you learn from those who've gone before you, who are above you or who are older. I actually think what the world is showing us now is that we need to learn from you, that the kind of the 
balance of power around learning and who holds what wisdom has shifted. And I think that's super exciting. So it's not pushing the responsibility onto the next generation, but it is saying, I'm not sure that we're doing justice to the next generation by placing them kind of below <laughs> the industry that they ascend into. And I think that for me is gonna be a really exciting thing to unpack. So a bit like sisterhood, I want to give opportunity for the voices of next generation from around the world to, to kind of to, to share both the thoughts, the fears, the, the kind of the values um, and the challenges to challenge us as DNAD and to challenge us, um, I guess, as a generational thing here too, a, a challenge to the generations who've created this mess. Um, you know, how, how do we collaborate to, to, to make the world a better place? Here, yeah, here. Yeah. Well, I think um, that's a wonderful mandate for your year, and um, I wish you every success. These are important questions, and I'll support you in asking them and helping to find out the answers. Um, so uh, I think we're at the um, at the end of our time. So I'd just love to wrap up with a few thank yous. Um, and really, it's thank yous not for today, but for all the dinner with that have been happening this year. So um, there's the brilliant Felix Townsend, who did our wonderful yellow foodie identity, and he was a new blood winner from a couple of years back. Um, there's the equally brilliant Yuri Suzuki, who's a partner of Pentagram, who's done the, um, the brilliant theme music with all the pots and pan noises. Um, there's Joe Fletcher from Corn as well, who has, who's made it happen immaculately technically. Uh, and um, there's Katie, who has done all the, um, the titles and subtitles. I just don't know how she does that at that speed. It's absolutely amazing. Look, there they still are. Um, and there's a, and of course, then Laura Havlin, who's uh, heads up content at DNAD, who actually really is the person who's made all of this happen. So huge thanks to Laura. Um, then super importantly, thanks to everyone who's tuned in and asked questions. And I hope taken away some uh, good advice or chosen which bits of advice to take and which bits to um, ignore. Um, and of course, uh, thanks to all the brilliant creative people who came to dinner. Um, there was Trey Seals, the unstoppable civil rights typographer. Pablo Rocha, the inspiring, the mischievous social media, media artist. Um, Paloma Strelitz, the, the just amazingly articulate ex assemble architect and digital thinker. Um, the very brilliant Jody uh, Hudson Powell and Luke Powell, my partners at Pentagram. Um, there was Josie Tucker and Richard Ashton, Ashton the brave creative environment, environmentalist from Adapt Climate Club. Um, Mona Chalabi, the fearless data journalist and force of nature. Um, Last month, we had Kim Gehrig, uh, did director extraordinaire and this year's president's award winner. And finally, the incomparable Rebecca Wright, who will, as we've been saying, be next year's president of DNAD starting tomorrow, I guess. Um, but thanks for thanks to Rebecca uh, for a brilliant session and thanks to all the dinner with. Uh, I've had huge fun, learned so much, and I hope they've been inspiring and useful for everyone who's come along to dinner with me. Thank you. Thank you, Narish.